You know, uh, rather similarly wonderful things happened to me moving to New York in 2001. Um, I arrived uh, at uh, CUNY Graduate Center and uh, found myself in the midst of a very friendly environment, having been basically expelled from my former university by adversarial forces. Um, but uh, Neil Smith, uh, who was already at the Graduate Center, said to me, he said, well, you've got to get used to the graduate students around here. Uh, and they're very different from what you're used to. He said, um, the students here, he said, are very streetwise, but they're not very bookwise. Uh, and you probably have to spend some time uh, teaching them the book stuff. And he said, you're used to students who are very bookwise, but they don't know where the street is. <laughs> and that turned out to be very true. And one of the things that happened to me is what I, not only did I find myself soon with rather enormous audiences in, in my sort of annual Reading Marx's Capital class, but a bunch of graduate students who at some point or other said, this is ridiculous that you're just doing it for this stuff. Why don't we film it and put it on the web? Uh, I wouldn't have the faintest idea how to go about doing that sort of thing, but they're incredibly savvy about this sort of thing. This is not exactly street-wise, this is kind of media-wise and media-savvy. And so they essentially did it. And uh, I have to say that the, the effect has been uh, fantastic. Uh, and, and I'm intensely grateful to them. Uh, and they actually created a website, which is uh, a bit astonishing. Again, I wouldn't know how to go about doing something like that. And they've effectively you know, done this, and they, they, they take stuff and, and, and really run with it very, very quickly. Um, but in the process, of course, there was a written version of, uh, of the Marx lectures that, that's come out, and it's over here. Uh, but in, in doing that, I, I had to start to think and, and, and teach the text a little bit more responsibly than I, I generally did when I, you know, you as Eric mentioned yesterday, when you, when you teach something, you know, nobody remembers what you said anyway, so you say anything you like. And then, <laughs> and when, it, when, it, when it goes down to posterity, it's going to be on the web, you kind of feel, well, you better be a little more careful <laughs> and, and what you say, and, and you don't want to take the liveliness and spontaneity out of it, but you do want to think a little bit about what, what it, exactly it is that you're, you're, you're doing. And now we're revving up to put volume two on the web next semester. And, and uh, this has set me thinking even more uh, on a very simple kind of question, which is really, what is it that, that Marx can teach us and what can we learn from Marx? Uh, but beyond that, what is it we have to do for ourselves? Uh, and that becomes, I think, a rather important issue when you start to look at the contemporary situation and say, well, in what ways does a reading of Marx's capital and an understanding of Marx's capital help us understand the present situation? And to what degree do we have to actually work at not only what Marx said, but also elaborate upon it in the right mm -hmm. kinds of ways so that it is relevant to our contemporary circumstances? And this uh, uh, question has been bugging me a bit, and I want to talk a bit more deeply about it uh, today, but it, it, it goes with another question which has long been bugging me and has actually dictated a lot of uh, my work that I've been doing over the last uh, 30, if not 40 years. Uh, on the very first page of Capital, uh, Marx is talking about uh, the commodity. And he comes to the concept of use values, and then he says, well, I'm not going to talk further about use values because to dis discover the uses of things, he says, is the work of history. And that immediately says to you on page one of Capital that Marx is differentiating somehow or other between the world of political economy and the world of history. And you see that very clearly, of course, <laughs> when you read all the political economic writings, uh, the three volumes of Capital and Surplus Value and the Grundrisse, and then you go off and you read the 18th Brumaire and Class Struggles in France, and it seems like you're in different worlds. And, and my initial uh, interest in Marx was really to be in that second world of the 18th Brumaire and, and Class Struggles in France, because 
uh, I was specifically interested in the time and the dynamics of urbanization, particularly in the city of Baltimore and what was going on in housing markets in Baltimore, what was going on in gentrification, what was going on in mortgage finance, what was going on in development in the city. So I, I was really very interested in urbanization and social justice in the city uh, was me saying, well, I, I don't have the tools given conventional urban theory to deal with what I'm encountering in Baltimore. I need something else and maybe Marx can give me the answer. And, and so the second part of social justice in the city was sort of looking and saying, well, maybe there's a Marxist <coughs> interpretation that can help me. And the one thing I learned from that second part of social justice in the city was I hadn't the faintest clue what Marx was talking about. So it seemed to me that actually it was then very important to try to actually figure out what it was that Marx was saying in order to find out whether it would actually help me, uh, you know, sort of understand uh, the urban dynamics that are going on around me. But the, the end project of what I was really interested in was the urban dynamics. I, I wasn't wanting to be a Marxist theorist or anything like that at all, or a Marxist philosopher. I wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to know what can I get out of this text that's going to help me understand things like how land markets work, how capital accumulation works through cities, how developers work, how finance of urbanization is constructed, all those kinds of questions. So I started to work on Marx and that kind of led into me sort of writing this you know, big kind of text on uh, uh, the limits to capital. But the thing about that text, which I think differentiated it from a lot of others that are coming out, you know, sort of going over Marx's theory, that was I was particularly interested in things like fixed capital formation. Uh, I, and I was particularly interested in the relationship between fixed capital formation and the credit system. And of course I found Marx's writings on the credit system were utter chaos and not very helpful. Uh, and I needed also to deal with, with land rent, and I also needed to do, deal with the spatialization with urbanization, uneven geographical development, all of those kinds of things. So I was, I was really pushing Marx's text into that direction uh, in a very different kind of way. So I was, in a way, trying to find a way to get from the theoretical apparatus into uh, the urbanization stuff. And it so happened in, in one of these, again, curious things. I went to Paris in 1976, I had a, a year... <coughs> And, and I really went there with the idea of studying Marxian theory, but I found all the big name theorists in Marxism at the time in Paris didn't want to talk to me. Uh, they regarded me as some inferior American being who couldn't possibly understand anything about Marx. I wasn't even worth So I actually started to think, well, I'd better work on the city instead. So I gave up bothering with the, you know, the high-flown Marxists and the Althusserians and all the rest of it, although there were, were some people I did talk to a lot. One was Manuel Castells and... And, and there were some people, uh, urban sociologists there, who were very good, so I worked with a small group of them. But basically, uh, I started to work very much more on the city. And, and, and uh, as I was wandering around the city and doing a sort of situationist derive all of the time around the place, it's a wonderful place, you understand why the situationists existed in Paris, and they didn't come from Los Angeles, because, you know, it's such an interesting place to do derives in. Uh, and, and so I, I would, you know, wander around, and I... And I had this weird encounter when I went up to Montmartre, as you have to do, and I went into the, the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur. And I found the place creepy. I really did. I found those, I felt very uncomfortable in there. I had no idea. You know, I was, I was getting shivers in the place. And there was this enormous figure of Christ, <coughs> a bleeding heart, and beneath it, it said, Gallia Ponitens. And I kind of asked somebody when I came back there, and I said, well, <coughs> what does France have to repent for? What, what was the, what's the problem? At that point, they said, oh, well, of course, it's built on the side of the commune. I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. When I was up there and I'm looking at all the tour guides, it didn't say anything about the commune. So I, I then spent most of the year <coughs> researching into how the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur was built and what its relationship was with the Paris commune. And, and I wrote a piece about the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur, which, of course, uh, got me close to thinking a lot about the Paris commune. And, and, and then that immediately got me back into, well, how, how did the Paris commune happen? What happened in the period before in the Second Empire? What happened between the Revolution of 1848 and 1871? Which led me into this big project about trying to reconstruct uh, the urbanization of Second Empire Paris. Uh, in a way, kind of going between Marx's 18th Brumaire and the class struggles in, in France. But I tried to do it in a way in which I was actually deploying the categories of political economy around questions of, you know, the credit system, about land rent, uh, about the dynamics of spatial organization and spatial structure and so on. So it, in a way, I, I found myself halfway between, if you like, those uh, historical studies of Marx and, and the theoretical by trying to sort of get into the middle there. And, 
a lot of my work ever since has been in that in that in that middle zone in between in between the two. And I, I think what's what's been happening recently is I've been, felt increasingly comfortable about being in that middle zone and taking concepts rather fluidly from the, plu the, 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 the political economy and bringing them into uh, historical geographical situations and using it in a sort of fluid way. And if, and, and if the concepts don't work right, then it's the concept for the problem. And, you know, so, so I mean, I'm prepared actually to do a lot more revisionism of, of Marx's conceptual apparatus as, as time goes on in order uh, to make it work in terms of what the real objective I always had, which is to understand the dynamics of urbanization. <coughs> so what I really wanted to talk about then was those two ideas and those two themes and, and, and what, it, what it leads me to do in thinking about the, the particular structure uh, that Marx imposes on his argument in Capital. And I've been thinking about this for some time, and of course one of the things that immediately comes to you is that, well, he's usually very explicit about these things, <coughs> Uh, but you have to be very careful to figure out where he is being explicit. And if you don't notice, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll bruise, breeze past things, uh, you know, like sometimes the key footnotes, uh, one that I use in Capital a lot now, which is very key to part of my argument about co-evolution and co-revolutionary co movements, uh, those sorts of things. So you've got to be, as it were, to look very carefully and see what it is that Marx is saying and what he's doing. And I, I suddenly, suddenly, said, well, you know, maybe I should go back and read again, and a couple of, three year, years ago, I did a class on the Grundrisse, and, and I started suddenly to notice a whole bunch of things going on in the Grundrisse that I hadn't really noticed before and thought about before. And I realized something uh, also about the structure of argument in Marx's capital, which relates very much <coughs> to the argument he makes in, in the Grundrisse. And what he does in the introduction there, which is actually a piece from the Critique of uh, Political Economy published a bit earlier, he puts it, he puts it this way in, in when he talks about the relationships between production, distribution, exchange, and consumption. What Marx does, of course, throughout his work is to work off the, 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 the language of classical political economy. That was his primary source of information and ideas. Uh, in effect, what Marx says is that, look, there are a lot of people who are very smart, very intelligent, who were desperately concerned to try to figure out what was going on in the world around them from the sort of 17th century onwards, William Petty, you know, right the way through, you know, it could be Mandeville, it could be Adam Smith, uh, Stuart, all the rest of it, and Ricardo. And Marx basically kind of accredited them with trying to figure out what was going on. And Marx did not do an empirical inquiry and then get into what he's doing. What he did was to critique classical political economy. And in critiquing classical political economy, he was looking for the gaps, he was looking for the contradictions, and saying, what is it that they're missing? And of course, the figure that was missing was the figure of the laborer. What were they missing? They didn't get the theory of surplus value. Uh, they didn't understand, uh, you know. So, he, so, so step by step, he reconstructs uh, a new political economy out of their political economy. Now, the good thing about this is that, of course, it gives a certain clarity to his argument. The bad thing about it is it does, it does actually confer a great deal of authority uh, on classical political e economy. And, and in particular, it gives a great deal of authority to the utopian visions of classical political e economy. So right throughout Capital, Marx does some very surprising things. He tends to assume perfectly functioning markets. You know, now, this is all strange because you would say, well, why, why is he doing that? Well, he wants to show that if the utopian vision of the classical political economist is, is realized, it's basically going to produce a result that is not going to be to the benefit of all, as they would claim. It's going to benefit a capitalist class, and the rest of the people are going to, re going to be reduced to penury, misery, and, 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 and the like. So he wants, he wants to, to sort of use their own techniques and their own argument uh, in order to destroy the fantasy that somehow or other this is a you know, the capitalist system, as they were depicting it, can eventually make the world a better place, provided you know, the government did its proper job and, and all those sorts of things. So this is, if you like, what he's trying to do. Now, he's also bugged, I think, by the idea he wants to create a science. And, and the science uh, has to be very rigorous. And one of the consequences of this is that throughout capital, he's constantly searching for something which is scientific and rigorous. 
And out of that comes the impression when you're reading the political economy that Marx is full of uh, almost a, a deterministic uh, kind, of, kind of structure. Uh, in which uh, forces are playing out which individuals are not in, in control of. And so you have this kind of uh, deterministic uh, scientific theory which he's constructing throughout Capital, which contrasts radically with, say, uh, the 18th Brumaire, in which you see voluntaristic, accidental forces colliding and, and class struggles articulating in this way and that way, in so, such, so that you can get an accidental figure like Louis Bonaparte, who suddenly becomes president and then makes a coup d'etat and all those kinds of things. So it seems like there are, there are two Marxes. One, one is this determinist, rigorous scientist, and the other is this voluntaristic, kind of non-deterministic sort of his, historian. And, and, you know, and then people kind of say, well, how can you put all that together and be various proposals? Or you do like something like Alvin Gordon says, well, actually, he's just schizophrenic. And, and, and there's no way in which you can put these two together and, and you've got to decide which one you, 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 you run with. So, so he's, he's bugged with that idea. And, and that idea is then manifest uh, very much in the Grundrisse in the following way. He says, production, distribution, exchange and consumption form a regular syllogism. This is not Marx talking about, this is not how, how I see it. This is how classical political economy in aggregate sees it. it they, they, they see it as a regular syllogism. Production is the generality, distribution and exchange the particularity, and consumption the singularity in which the whole is joined together. Okay, so the generality, the particularity, and the singularity. Then he says, production is determined by general natural laws. Not natural in the sense of physics, but they're like natural laws. Uh, distribution by social accident. Exchange stands between the two as formal social movement and the concluding act, consumption, which is conceived not only as a terminal point, but also as an end in itself, actually belongs outside of economics, except uh, insofar as it reacts in turn upon the point of departure and initiates the whole process anew. He then makes this following comment. While the syllogism is admittedly a coherence, he said, it is a shallow one. Uh, and what he then goes on is to reject the syllogistic form of classical political economy and displace it by, in favor of a dialectical conception of how production, distribution, exchange, and consumption might be brought together within the totality of relations comprising a capitalist mode of production. And he writes it this. The conclusion we reach is that production, distribution, exchange, and consumption form the members of a totality of relations comprising a capitalist mode of production. The uh, from, from, from the members of totality, distinctions within a unity. Mutual interaction takes place between the different moments. This is the case with every organic whole. Now immediately you kind of say, oh, it's an organic whole. This is not an organic whole of a Hegelian sort. It is a more of a kind of e ecosystemic uh, or, uh, organic whole, which is loosely bound together in, in, in what, uh, you know, people like Gramsci and, and Lefebvre were called an ensemble or uh, even Deleuze would call an assemblage of moments which are interactive uh, with each other. So this is, if you like, the general picture he's kind of setting up. Now, what this says, however, is that this, this generality versus particularity versus singularity uh, poses certain problems uh, for analysis. And there, in fact, earlier on in the Grundrisse, he's established another level, which is the universality. And the universal, universality is about the metabolic relation to nature. Now Marx deals a little bit with that, but he kind of says, basically, I'm not interested in talking about that. He then goes on to say, I'm not dealing with questions of distribution, and I'm certainly not dealing with questions of exchange, and, and I'm not going to deal with questions of consumption. My analysis is going to be at the level of generality. And right throughout Capital, he actually sticks to that as far as he can. And actually, one of the things that happens in Volume 3 is the distinctions start to fall apart, and I'll get to that in a minute. But let me give you some examples of exactly how this, how this works. Consider, for example, the question of exchange, when he kind of says exchange is, a, is just a formal movement, and I'm not really interested in talking about it in any detail. This leads him to be pretty cavalier about two very important processes which exist 
One is the whole kind of question of supply and demand. How does Marx handle supply and demand throughout capital? He says, well, supply and demand, sort of, they're about fluctuations in the market. But in the end, what, what, what fixes the distinction between how much shirts cost versus shoes is labor content, not supply and demand. It's not that there's a greater demand for shoes than there is for shirts, nothing to do with that. And he actually uses the following phrase, when supply and demand are in equilibrium, they cease to explain anything. And he says that several times. So therefore, I do not consider forces of supply and demand. Supply and demand are actually mechanisms that bring us to the equilibrium point, and I'm interested in the equilibrium relations. And that's what I want to explain, and the equilibrium relations can only be explained in terms of labor content. We can debate that if you like. But my point here is not to emphasize that, but to emphasize the way in which he removes supply and demand from the configuration and assumes that supply and demand are coming into equilibrium all of the time. Which then leaves the question, what happens if supply and demand are not coming into equilibrium? What happens if there are actually mechanisms in the market which are not doing that? Well, in that case, Marx's theory is not going to work very well. The second thing that happens <coughs> in the world of exchange is the nature of the forces doing the exchange. Marx throughout tends to assume a perfectly competitive economy. And, in fact, the number of times he will quote this phrase, the coercive laws of competition force something. So when in the chapter on the working day, he says, well, the coercive laws of competition force capitalists to the lowest common denominator in terms of lengthening the working day. When you get to the theory of relative surplus value, it's about, you know, innovating, innovative changes. And he said, well, here it is the coercive laws of competition that force capital uh, to actually uh, innovate and can keep up a train of innovation, of leapfrogging innovations. Uh, similarly, the, the laws of accumulation, which say accumulation for accumulation's sake, are propelled by the coercive laws of competition. So again and again and again, the coercive laws of competition come up as absolutely vital to the argument. But at each time he encounters them, he spends less than about three, three sentences on them and says, these are not actually what I'm concerned with here. Uh, and in the Grundrisse, so he actually calls competition the enforcer of the inner logic of capitalism. And it's an enforcement mechanism, and as an enforcement mechanism, it is of no interest to the argument. But it then raises the question, what happens if the enforcer is asleep? What if the enforcer is not working? And what happens when you don't have a competitive situation, but you have oligopoly, you have monopoly? And Baran and Sweezy, at least, in, in Monopoly Capital, were prepared to say the law of value in Marx doesn't work if you don't have the coercive laws of competition. But Marx, throughout, does not actually take the coercive laws of competition and, 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 and you know, he, he, at some time he, he threatened to write a book on competition. He never did. So this, these are two mechanisms of exchange which are very crucial, and he makes that the assumption throughout Capital all three volumes, that the coercive laws of competition are doing their work. The, the enforcers are doing the job expected of them. Now, in reality, that doesn't always happen. In the Second Empire Paris, there was a good deal of monopoly control around. I mean, monopolistic, monopoly capital was alive and well in Paris at the time. It was within Paris, it wasn't bigger than that, but nevertheless, in the omnibus system and all the rest of it, you have, you have a tremendous monopolization going on. And in fact, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, arguments coming out at the end of the 1860s kind of saying, this is monopoly capital that we're, we're, we're facing. So, so the question of monopoly starts to come up uh, very frequently. And, and Marx himself at various points says, says, well, yeah, the end point of competition is nearly always going to be monopoly. So in his looser kind of comments, he's recognizing that the coercive laws of competition don't always work. And if they do, they actually uh, work to be self-destructive. So there's, there's a couple of of, of points, if you like, uh, where th this assumption works throughout all of, all, of, all, all of capital. The particularities is distribution. Now he's faced with a problem here because land is an input into production. Labor is an input into production. Money, capital, is an input into production. Yet Marx does not want to deal with the distributional shares that all of those elements gain. So, very interesting. 
when you're reading Marx's Capital, what does he say about wages? Well, he says there's something called the value of, of, of labor power. And he spends a page and a half talking about the various things co that act can actually affect the value of labor power. And you just go through a long laundry list of these, the state of class struggle, the degree of civilization in the country, the climate, the, you know, just a whole long list of, of things that could affect wages. And then at the end of it, he says, well, I'm not interested in doing, dealing with all of these. Uh, in a given situation, the wage rate, the value of labor power is now. Full stop. And from then on, no more about what affects wages. And when you get to the three chapters on wages later on in the chapter, it doesn't, it doesn't take up any of those issues at all. It just merely elaborates the theory of relative uh, and, and, and absolute surplus value again and a few things like that and talks about the difference between piecework and, 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 uh, and, and hourly wages. So, so, so here too, he doesn't actually talk about actual wages and actual wage levels at all. And in terms of distribution, he doesn't ever, in volume one of Capital, really deal with the question of where does the initial money capital come from? Well, it's just there. And he doesn't deal with that because to deal with that means you have to deal with the financial system. And if you're dealing with the financial system, you have to start dealing with the question of interest. And he doesn't want to deal with that because that's a distributive share. And the rate of interest is determined, we find out when you get to volume three, by what? Supply and demand. Hmm. So when you get into volume three, suddenly a lot of this kind of formulaic stuff start to fall, really fall apart. But nevertheless, throughout most of capital, what you find is that these distributive shares are not taken seriously, and nor is land rent taken seriously. So the examination of the dynamics and the laws of motion of capital is constructed in such a way as to ignore the actual dynamics of distributive shares. Now, I, would, I find this very difficult, you see, to take that theory and bring it into uh, a situation where I want to know what finance capital is doing, what its role is in, in, in urban investments, and what, what the rentier uh, is doing, and, and what land rent is about. I need to know all those kinds of things. So, you know, here's Marx giving me a theory that doesn't give me those things. So Marx's general theory, then, is, is at that level of generality of production. But he then says some very peculiar things about the relationship between production and distribution. And when you first read them, and when I first read them, A, I thought it was gibberish. And B, when I started to understand it, I completely misunderstood it. Uh, and, and finally, you know, you, 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 I'm a slow learner, you know, on this stuff. I mean, I really am. And, and it took me a while to figure, figure it out. But what, what, he, what he says is... is is, is this. Um, he says that actually there's a certain set of relation uh, uh, between these elements. Uh, to begin with, he, he comes back to the, the argument I've just been making. He says, capital is posited doubly as an agent of production, as a source of income, as a determinant of specific forms of distribution. The category of wages, similarly, is the same as that which is examined under a different heading as wage labor. So you talk about wage labor in the world of production, wages is the actual distributive share. Uh, so while Marx is sort of sidelining these, uh, what he then does is, is to start to put together uh, all of these things within the orga what he calls the orga organic uh, totality. And what I have to do is to find the, the peculiar uh, passage where he, where he does this. Um, okay, here we go. Production, he says, <coughs> predominates not only over itself uh, in the antithetical definition of production, but over other moments as well. The process always returns to production to begin anew. This is a sort of familiar thesis, production dominates over all else. That exchange and consumption cannot be predominant is self-evident. Likewise, distribution as distribution of products, while as distribution of the agents of production, it is a moment of production. A definite production thus determines a definite consumption, distribution, and exchange, as well as definite relations between these different moments. Admittedly, however, in its one-sided form, production is itself determined by the other moments. Now, go make sense of that, if you possibly can. <laughs> So, so what, what does all this mean? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to realize what he means by production here. And what he means when he says production dominates 
over production as an antithetical form. For a long time I thought, well, production is about material, material production, and this is the familiar thesis that material production dominates over, you know, every, sociality and everything else. But actually, what is being produced in the whole of Volume 1 of Capital? What is it, what is it that's central in the central consideration of production in Volume 1 of Capital? It's a production of surplus value. It's not the production of things, it's not the production of commodities, it's not the labor process, it's a production of surplus value. <clears throat> and the antithetical form of production is indeed the material labor process. And he's saying basically the material labor process has to be dominated by the requirement that it produce surplus value. Now produce, the production of surplus value is not a material thing. It is a social relation. It is the production and reproduction of a social relation. And that is what is the specific form of capitalist production. It's about the production of surplus value, perpetual production of surplus value. And it's that that dominates over all of the other moments, not the labor process. The labor process is rendered subservient to the production of surplus value. And then when he kind of says, well, all of these other moments uh, are also dominated in the same kind of way, then in effect what this says is actually what you will see in the world is the possibility of all sorts of different distributive arrangements, all sorts of different consumption regimes as singularities, all sorts uh, of different distributive shares, provided that wherever you are, surplus value is being produced. In other words, Chile can do it in one way, you can do it one way in Chile, and you can do it a completely different way in Scandinavia. And as long as they both produce surplus values, they can, the surplus value, they can coexist. So when he sort of says production is determinate, the production of surplus value is determinate, if the distributive arrangements interfere with the production of surplus value, then they have to give, away, give way. If the consumption regime is irrelevant to the production of surplus value and cannot be engineered to, to relate to surplus value, it too has to give way. So you can have all kinds of different consumption regimes and all sorts of cultural different differences and all this sort of thing. I mean, in a way, somehow, this, this, this arrangement he set up uh, does two things. One is it consolidates the generality of what capitalism is about in terms of the production of surplus value. And it allows us to abstract from all sorts of historical situations and gives us a template in which to understand how capitalism actually works. And that to me is, is a very, very significant achievement and it explains precisely why that Marx, writing about the crisis of 1857-58, could abstract from the, that, that crisis and give us a general theory that we can actually look at today in relationship to what is going on right now. So in a way, by making those assumptions, he has allowed himself to create the general laws of motion at that level of generality. But that level of generality exists in a world where, you know, all of these different distributive arrangements and all these different consumption regimes and all these other different things can, can be going on simultaneously. And there is no tight determination that says it has to actually be like this. And precisely because he says distribution is a particularity, that particularity can look very different in one part of the world rather than another. Now, what that says to me is that when you get back to this idea that there is an organic totality, all right, what we have to understand is the organic totality. And in order to do that, we have to understand how all of those moments of production, distribution, exchange, uh, and consumption are working together. That is what we have to do. But we have to do that for our society in our time and talk very specifically about how those arrangements in, in our particular time are, are actually operating against the background of this template of the dynamics of capital accumulation and of surplus value production. So one of the things that Marx does throughout three volumes of capital is he sticks very rigorously, and if you want to be critical, rigidly, to this notion. And again and again you'll find, even when you get to the chapters, one of the reasons the chapters on, on <coughs> finance and, and credit are so confused is he keeps on saying things like 
I only want to consider here those elements of what's going on in this distributive world insofar as they have some effects on production. But he doesn't quite know how to gauge when they're having effects on production and when they're not. And he gets in a particular kind of problem because what determines the interest rate, he said, well, there's, there's no way in which the interest rate is a relationship between capitalists. There's therefore no value transaction going on here. It is simply about the supply and demand of money capital. So supply and demand, which he's ex excluded from the analysis earlier on, is coming into the picture. Uh, the question of the coercive laws of competition is coming into the picture. Some other elements like fictitious capital start to come into the picture. All of those, those elements start to come into the picture and you can start to see that some of those boundaries he set up to try to insulate the, the laws of motion of capital uh, to insulate them from interference, if you like, and contamination by specific uh, concerns for uh, what the distributive share is between profit, profit and wages, for example, or what, how, what the rent uh, rate is and what the interest rate is. He wants to insulate himself from all of that, but some of that starts to break down at a certain point. But it, it is in the world of production, the world of generality, that he says we can actually establish the law-like character of a capitalist mode of production. And we have to understand that's where the law-like character lies. And that was therefore for me one of the key things that allowed me in the enigma of capital to start to say, well, what does this law-like character look like and what does this actually tell us about where the, where, where the crisis might be and how the crisis might have organized? But in order to do that, we also have to come back to some of the very specific nature of the arrangements, particularly arrangements of finance capital and financialization, all those kinds of questions. And, and what the actual wage rate is and how the wage rate has been determined over the last 30 years and why the share of wages in national income has been declining, all those kinds of questions. We have to enter them in. That's the work we have to do for ourselves. Marx can't do that work, but he gives us a template to work from. And there's an interesting sense in which he keeps on uh, uh, sort of saying again and again, I really want to be scientific. And to be scientific, I, I want to produce a, a theory that's like the, the law of gravity. Now, I, I think that's probably not a good analogy. I, the analogy I like to use is, is the analogy of, of the laws of fluid dynamics. Now, if you're interested in atmospheres and, and, and oceanic circulations and, and river motions and all that kind of stuff, there are some wonderfully, beautifully laid out laws of thermodynamics of motion and this kind of thing. Uh, but you can't just go to those laws of thermodynamics and say, okay, this is, these are the laws of thermodynamics, here's the weather forecast for the next five weeks. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't even go from the laws of thermodynamics to actually explain exactly how hurricanes formed yesterday. But no scientist would ever say, well, because you can't go directly from there to there, we're going to abandon all the laws of th thermodynamics. They would say, no, no, actually, we're going to elaborate those laws even more and make them more sophisticated, and we're going to have to do a lot of work uh, to see how the laws of thermodynamics work out in the formation of hurricanes or work out in oceanic circulation or anything of that kind. We have to do a lot of work uh, to, 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 to make sure that these laws work, sort of, sort of how, they, how they operate. And I feel the same way about Marx's laws of motion of capital. That is, you can't take them and explain exactly what happened yesterday, or you can't explain you know, what's going to happen in the next three years at all. But it is an incredible, powerful template from which you can start to look at organic transformations in the way in which a social system works. And as you do that, you can come up with all sorts of different ways of, of starting to think about the dynamics of the process. And, and again, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm trying to not work, use the word you know, dialectical too much just so Eric doesn't have a heart attack. You know, so. <laughs> but, but actually, actually my, my dialectics, if you want to, is, is more process-based process philosophy than it is a Hegelian vision. And, and, and actually, uh, when I was really writing about this, the kinds of people I was looking at were, were Leibniz and Alfred North Whitehead and people like that. They're much more interesting to me than Hegel ever was. And actually, what Marx is always talking about is capital as process. It's in motion. And if the motion stops, then capital is finished. And therefore, it is a perpetual motion machine, and you have to keep the flow going. And that's why I like the analogy of, of, of fluid dynamics. It's a fluid system. And, and therefore, the process becomes significant. 
And so in the Enigma, when I was kind of looking at the way in which the, the barriers and the limits that exist within the process of flow, processual flow of capital accumulation, and then ask the question, where are the barriers? Where are the obstacles? Are there major obstacles here this time? Where were they last time? Well, last time it was labor, this time it's, uh, it's, it's under consumption. So actually you find yourself rewriting the whole of Marxian theory of crisis by kind of saying, well, the crisis can form at any one of those points because it's a blockage in the system. The process stops. And as soon as the process stops, you know, you're, you know you're in trouble. I mean, I arrived in New York City about uh, 10 days uh, before 9-11, and, and it was a bit astonishing being in New York City where everything stopped moving, literally stopped moving. Uh, everything was stationary. The bridges were closed, the, the tunnels were closed, no flights were coming in or out, the traffic wasn't moving, uh, the whole place was stationary. And, 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 you know, three or four days later, what did Giuliani do? He said, for God's sake, get out and start shopping, get your credit cards out. Yeah. Go, you know, go out, the, go, go, you've got to get back in. And I don't know if you remember, Bush actually appeared in a, in a collective airline commercial saying to everybody, get back in the air and fly again. I mean, so, so, so a stoppage like that was costing an enormous amount of money. And, you know, and uh, just think what happened when the Icelandic bankers sort of lit up a volcano and, and screwed the transportation across the Atlantic. Uh, you know, the, the cost of, of, of a blockage of this system, the motion, if the motion stops, you're in real trouble. So actually then you start to look for all the blockage points. And actually volume two is very full of all of these blockage points all over again. It's full of, full of arguments about that. S crises in the circulatory system. And, and these crises in the circulatory system sometimes relate to deeper crises which can occur in the production system, but at the same time, the, uh, when you get into volume three, you, you start to talk about circulatory crises which are autonomous. So the word autonomous actually comes up in the chapters on, on finance capital. And, 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 the, and, and actually it comes up a li little in the chapters on, on, on merchant capital and the role of merchant capital. So by looking at, by looking at what's, what's, what's going on through this template, you can get a very different sort of kind of, kind of an idea of, 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 of what, what the problems uh, might be. And, and in particular, of course, when you get into this circulatory stuff, you're starting to talk about circulation in space and time and the rapidity of turnover and the acceleration of turnover and the impression and, and, and what comes out of that. And again, if the coercive laws of competition are doing their work, then that's going to mean accelerating turnovers of, uh, of everything, uh, including the kind of uh, daily life habits and, 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 and so on. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, which actually then gives you some important clues. For example, the turnover time in consumption. It's a very important issue. Uh, I'm still using my grandmother's knives and forks. If capital only made things like that, it would have been absolutely screwed for a market years and years ago. So it specialized in making things that fall apart. It specializes in things that, uh, that uh, have a very short, uh, quickly rendered obs obsolescent. Uh, it, it is actually specialized in, uh, in forms of consumption which are instantaneous. And I think uh, uh, Guy Debord was very prescient when he started to talk about the society of the spectacle, because the society is something that's instantaneously consumed, and 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 therefore and it's gone. And you know, it's not like my grandmother's forks. You know, I mean, they, they don't last at all. And so, so increasingly, urbanization has been rapidly caught up in, in in spectacle formation. And if you want good examples of that, just think of the opening ceremonies of Olympic Games what they looked like 15, 20 years ago and what they look like now. I mean, increasing emphasis on it's more and more spectacle, more and more spectacle. And more and more money is spent on producing a spectacle. And all of those places, by the way, that, 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 that staged the games, with the exception of Los Angeles, have gone bust afterwards, including, of course, Greece, uh, which is a, a very interesting relationship between, between the staging of the Olympic Games and the debt encumbrance of, uh, of Greece. This is, this is a, not a, an unfamiliar story. Montreal, I think, is still playing, uh, paying off its games from you know, decades and decades ago. So, but the point here is that actually urbanization has essentially more and more got caught up in the society of the spectacle. Even to the point where people are encouraged themselves to be the spectacle. I mean, what is Facebook all about? <laughs> if it's not precisely doing that. People creating spectacles of themselves all over the place, <laughs> and 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 actually, you know, what is it that's feeding off that? Well, well, there's a tremendous amount that's feeding off that. So, so, so this is a world that we're, that we're moving into, which where where the, the turnover time of, of, of consumerism 
becomes absolutely essential and critical for the dynamics of capital as having a harder and harder time establishing its market uh, with, with, you know, with, with ordinary kinds of normal goods and services. So there are issues of this kind which, which immediately come in. But then there are the dynamics about what goes on within the totality. And one of the arguments I made, I made in the Enigma book was, again, to, to, to take Marx quite literally. In, in, a, in that footnote at the beginning of uh, uh, chapter 15, where he talks about, uh, you know, how technology discloses its relation to nature. And what I do with that is to say, <coughs> look, if you look very carefully at how Marx actually describes the rise of capitalism <coughs> throughout capital, then what you will see is a story, which is a very complicated story, of co-evolutionary movement. And, and here I, I really try to emphasize to students, get away from those one-liners. You know, all history is the history of class struggle. Marx has done with, you know. Or productive forces, revolutions in productive forces impel historical change. Story done with. Well, actually, if that was the case, then why why does the chapter on, on machinery and modern industry come after capital has instantiated itself very, very well in the medieval period in the manufacturing system? At that point, Marx says, the problem for capital at that point it was it had not yet discovered a technology adequate to its own basis. It had to do that, and that's what it did in creating the factory system. It came at the end of the sequence, not at the beginning. So, when you, but when you actually examine what he says in that chapter, it's really very interesting. This entailed all sorts of things. It entailed a revolution in mental conceptions. It meant, it meant that you had, to, you had to reconceptualize the nature of the production process. You had to see it not as an art, but you had to see it as a, as a science and a technology. And you had to break it down into its component parts. There was a transformation of social relations. A transformation of social relations that was not only uh, about skills and de-skilling and all that kind of thing, it was also, and, and, and class and all the rest of it. It was also about gender and the family and all the rest of it. There's a tremendous kind of disruption of social relations which is going on coterminously with the revolution of the factory, <coughs> factory system. The relation to nature is being radically transformed. So you end up, and, and the institutional arrangements are being transformed, so I end up kind of saying, look, Marx sets up these co-revolutionary moments in which you start to look at them, you look at the technological and organizational form. You look at the relation to nature. You look at the, uh, the, the nature of the, the, the actual production system, the labor process. You look at the social relations. You look at daily life. You look at mental conceptions of the world, and you look at institutional and legal arrangements. And, and actually, any the, the, the emergence of, of capitalism out of <coughs> feudalism involve a co-revolutionary movement of all of those moments. Sometimes it's the various moments, one or other will be in, a, in, in, in the advance, but if the others didn't follow, then it was held back. Why did the Chinese have all kinds of new technologies and never go further with them? Because the other movements didn't, the other pieces didn't move and actually shut it down. Why is it that some of these movements started and then got shut down? I mean, in some ways, I always kind of like to think of Christianity and Judeo-Christian ethic and, and Catholicism as actually lying at the origins of capitalism. Why? Because they had a linear view of history, a linear view of time, in which you could start to look at accumulation forever. And also, of course, you could buy entry into heaven by indulgences and all the rest of it. So you monetized entry into heaven. And, and so, but then at that point, they get scared. So what do they do? They shut it down and they start to say, you know, in charging interest is, is illegal. We, we, we've got to somehow or other control this whole thing. So again and again, historically, you see a movement on one or other of these. You see technological revolutions occurring in Flanders in the 12th and 13th centuries, which then get held back because the other movements don't move. The social relations don't change or something of that kind. So actually, there's a story being told here of a co-revolutionary movement of, of transformation. And again, this is about looking at the totality and looking at this. And at this point, I say, well, you know, if we're interested in the transition from capitalism to socialism or communism or whatever, then you have to look also at a co-revolutionary movement across all of those moments. The big, big fault, it seems to me, is to say that one of those moments is dominant. And all you have to do is to change that one and everything else follows. That was, if you like, the Soviet model. 
get the productive forces in motion, and everything else follows. Well, if you didn't change mental conceptions and you didn't play in social relations and all the rest of it, you don't. Nothing happens. And, and it was a failure to actually imagine a co-revolutionary movement, which is really, really problematic uh, about, about, what, uh, you know, about past communism. But actually, it's interesting, social theory. How much of social theory is a single bullet explanation of social change? I mean, we have the technological determinists. You know, you go read Tom Friedman, Mr. Flat Earth Friedman, you know, and he kind of says, well, you know, yeah, people call me a technological determinist, and, 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 and they tell me Marx is one, which he wasn't. Uh, so I guess I'm a Marxist, says Tom Friedman. I don't know. <laughs> and, but then, but then, you know, but then there are people who kind of say, well, it's the environment. You know, Jared Diamond, we've got the kind of the, the, the sort of new environmental determinism. Then you've got all those people who came, well, it's really social relations. You've got the idealist who say it's mental conceptions. And everybody's, you know, you can just go around and you can identify all kinds of social scientists in this camp and that camp saying this is the leading thing. Including many Marxists who say, well, it's the productive forces, and others say it's the social relations, and some will say, well, you can't say mental conceptions, but that might be, co might be Hegelian. But actually, Marx is very, cons I mean, why the hell did he write capital if he wasn't interested in mental conceptions? He's trying to change our mental conceptions of the world. And what this says is that a co-revolutionary movement has to have an alliance of forces which can walk, work across all of those co-revolutionary moments. I mean, I'm, I'm interested, what I work on is, is mental conceptions. I'm trying to change people's mental conceptions of the world, but I'm under no illusion that somehow or other if I change mental conceptions, anything much is going to happen unless there's something going on in all those other areas. So the interesting question is to be in alliance with people who are there in the technology and there in relation to nature and try to find a, a way, if you like, to set up an alliance of forces which are going to actually transform the evolution of a capitalist system. And if you doubt me on this, for those of you who are old enough to remember, think how all those elements hung together, say, in 1970. What were social relations like in 1970? What were technologies like in 1970? I mean. You know, you say to students, you know, we didn't have any copying machines. I said, oh, what did you do? <laughs> say, well, actually, if you, wanted, if you wanted to get information, you had to take notes. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, it's very interesting. When I took notes, I actually read the article. What I do now is I photocopy them, I put them on the shelf, and I often forget they're there, you know. <laughs> And, and ten years later, I pull out and I say, well, how did I get a photocopy of this, you know? I mean, uh, it, so, so... So the things, things are, ch are, are changing, and have changed and radically in terms of, of mental conceptions. That is, people think radically different now. We're all neoliberals without knowing it, in ways that we're not. The, the, the sense of social solidarity was very different back in 1970. Many of the things that are being done politically right now, you couldn't do back then. I mean, people would have just absolutely stopped the whole damn economy by you know, doing some of the things they're doing now. And, and, and a kind of, so, so the world is, so neoliberalism, actually, as a project, was about moving across all of those dimensions. And it did it very successfully. It revolutionized all of them. And it's capitalism a perpetually revolutionary force. Therefore, it's moving across all of those dimensions. But it's not a determinate force. What it is, is a force which is actually guided by social processes. And to the degree that we can intervene in those social processes, we could turn it in a different direction than one it's going right now. As I said yesterday, what we're seeing right now is a consolidation of neoliberalism without the legitimation. Because they don't need the legitimation anymore. They don't care anymore. They don't have to legitimate it anymore because they've got a passive population in front of them and they ain't going to do anything. So they could just do it. And nobody's going to rise up in wrath and stop the whole damn system. So, you know, the, 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 the dynamics uh, have, ha, uh, have been there. And what I would want to do is to say, well, when you think about that co-revolutionary movement, again, it's a template. It doesn't tell you exactly. It's a template against which you can start to think about the dynamics of social transformation. In the same way that the other laws of motion stuff about capital are, uh, form a template through which you can start to sort of make arguments about what's going on this time around. What's special about this crisis that was not there, say, in the 1970s? What's different to the, in this crisis to the one that was way done in the 1930s? And why are we coming out of this one differently than, than we came out of the one in the 1930s? So those are the kinds of issues that, 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 that arise. So my point here is to say that, on the one hand, 
do not expect too much of Marx. Marx's theory is very explicit in what his objective is. And there's a myth around that somehow or other he was trying to explain everything. He wasn't. He was trying to actually establish the laws of motion of capital as expressed in that generality. And you can say he succeeded reasonably well, and I think he did, but there are a lot of rough ends, ends and, and which need to be cleaned up and cleared up, uh, and in particular, the feedback dynamics that come from things like the credit system and, and, and rental arrangements and all of that probably need to be much more clearly articulated. And the, the, in other words, there's a good deal of more work to be done on, on the generality level. But from that perspective also, when we come to a particular situation, you can't cram the, this particular situation into that generality as if somehow or other it gives you the clues and everything's going to pop out and, and, and explain what's going on. That's not what it's there for. It's a template that you use to then actually work out for yourself what is going on. And in working out for yourself, of course, you're coming closer to explaining the historical situation in theoretical terms. In other words, that gap between the political economy and the historical stuff starts to disappear. That, in some ways, is what I was trying to do in The Enigma of Capital, was to try to narrow that gap, to use a theoretical template and make very clear what the theoretical template was, which is, you know, and, and at the same time, kind of try to explain the dynamics of much of what's going on around us uh, through adding to it and, 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 and doing, doing enough work as I could to, to try to give real kind of on-the-ground meaning to what, what was going on. Whether I succeeded or not is another matter, but that was, if you like, the objective and the aim. And it seems to me that that is the proper way in which to, to, to use Marx. And, and, and not, not to have too much expectation of it. But at the same time realize what he did achieve, which was absolutely fantastic, which, which is to give us that template that we can then utilize, like the laws of fluid dynamics, to really start to look at, you know, Climate, the equivalent of climate change, which is social change, and 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 uh, all of the all the turbulence that's going on around us, as happens climatically as well, in relationship to the laws of fluid dynamics, and it's that analogy that I think uh, fits very well with with uh, the way I, I I read Marx and the way I want to try try to teach Marx uh, to, to to people. So okay, I yak it on well enough. So let me leave it there. Thanks very much. I do. Um, speaking of uh, the spectacle of consumerism, in the last week, one of the big stories was that Apple won't be selling a white iPhone. I thought that was incredible. And then um, another thing was, uh, in an in a interview, Larry Wilkerson, uh, former chief of staff for Colin Powell, um, uh, said that there was an a argument in the Bush White House in the early years between Cheney who wanted to start another Cold War with China, and Bush, who realized that we needed uh, Chinese labor to uh, uh, keep up the standard of living uh, with falling wages and things like that. Um, and also Wilkerson credited to the uh, fact that Bush's father was a diplomat to China. Would you just comment on that? I, I think, uh, I mean, it was a very interesting moment in the uh, 9-11 hearings where Condoleezza Rice said uh, when the Bush administration took office uh, they didn't look as, you know, they, they, she was accused of not paying attention to the Al-Qaeda threat. And she said, well, we have many other things on our mind, in particular the China question. Uh, and uh, if you remember, there was a spy plane incident where uh, a U.S. spy plane was uh, collided with a Chinese fighter and had to land in China and there was this big fuss about it. Uh, and uh, there were rumors of a considerable saber rattling from certain sectors of the White House. And uh, the guess was that people like Walmart and General Motors basically called the White House and said, don't you dare, because <laughs> that's where all our profit's coming from. And uh, so I don't think it would be even as sophisticated as uh, actually being concerned about uh, low-wage goods for the United States market. I don't think even need to get that far. Probably U.S. corporate power <coughs> by then was so embedded in China that any attack upon China would have been an attack upon them. And so uh, at that point, the uh, U.S., I think, uh, backed off and, and, and is 
rather powerless right now to do that much about the, the Chinese question. Yeah. In the um, historic transition from feudalism to capitalism, I agree utterly with your characterization that there's multiple dimensions that had to get an alignment, <coughs> multiple transformations, and if you only had some of them, you get blocked development. Right. But the process by which those multiple bits got transformed in the right way was largely haphazard, trial and error, contingent processes, rather than anybody figuring it out ahead of time. Yeah. The transition from capitalism to socialism is not plausibly going to happen as an accidental byproduct of all the things we do. It, it, at least that's my feeling. That the accidental byproduct is more likely to be the barbarism alternative to capitalism than the socialism one. Um, so substantively, what do you think are the configurational requirements for a transformation? That is, what's your vision of what the destination is in order for us to know how to put the different, begin to think about how to put the different pieces together for a transformation? Well, you know, this is the kind of thing where you and I should have some serious conversations. <laughs> <laughs> that was why I asked the question. Yeah, right. No, no, I, I mean, it's, it, it's I, I don't have, uh, uh, you know, some sort of, Blueprint at all no, of for, for this. Uh, um, all, all I th uh, first, first off, I think that to some degree, uh, I would hope that any transition that occurs is going to be consequent upon uh, uh, the development of uh, thought and practices that are conscious decisions about the kind of evolutionary trajectory. Uh, that we wish to pursue and uh, in part when I'm working on ideas like uh, what would uh, a new pattern of urbanization look like uh, it's about you know what new <coughs> social relations would we be seeking to enhance and there's a very practical side to that what kind of relation to nature uh, we would be interested in, in, in pursuing what technologies would be adequate to a different kind of urban lifestyle, all those kinds of things. So I think there are ways in which, for example, let's, let's suppose in this country, Obama took very seriously the idea of having a national urban, stra urban strategy. I mean, he did talk about we should have something like that. We haven't had one of those sorts of things since the Carter years, I don't think. So let's suppose it was, it was something as con conscious as that. At that point, you would kind of say, well, let's really think about this. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a conscious kind of, kind of process of, 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 of transformation. So there are, if you like, practical ways to, to think about this and of, of intervening in it. And <coughs> it's not necessarily some sort of pie in the sky uh, argument. Uh, I would certainly argue that to the degree that the crisis we've just been in has been very much a crisis of urbanization, then the solution has to be uh, a reurbanization of some sort and a reconfiguration of uh, urbanization. And to the degree that there are no problems in the world right now of poverty and environment and all the rest of it that are not also deeply in, in embedded in the <coughs> urban dynamic, then, then there has to be a new urban dynamic. So I'm interested in working at it at that, working at, it at that level uh, with, uh, to some degree, some, some push. But again, it's it's, it's the idea of trying to get together an alliance of forces that, that are going to look at, uh, say, a, a new urbanization project for the United States, which is anti-suburban, uh, and, and uh, starts to, to, to re reconfigure <coughs> daily life in a, in a, around a different, <coughs> different model of, of daily living. Uh, and there are lots of minor experiments all over the place, actually, going on with these sorts of things. And the big issue is, can they be connected together in some way uh, in, in to make a broader kind of attack upon uh, upon this bigger question that, that uh, I'm I'm trying to pose. So I don't I don't see uh, I don't see some uh, you know some uh, you know Vatican Council making some decision about you know w what we do. But I think there are uh, very very concrete ways in which we can start to think about the process of transition at, at all these. Different, different levels. I mean, I'm always shocked every time I, I fly over the United States and I look down and I look at the pattern of urbanization and I think, how absolutely crazy this is. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, no, this is nonsense. 
and, but you know, the, one of the things that comes out of that is, of course, uh, you know, we, we make urban environments and then we live in them and we draw our values from them and the suburban values that come out of the suburbs are actually part of the big political problem right now. Uh, and most people want to stay in their suburbs and don't want to change. They, want, like, they like those suburban ways of life. So there are, there are all sorts of issues of that kind that I'd rather work on uh, sort, of, sort of directly without kind of having some kind of, you know, grand, grand council. But I think, you know, well, you know perfectly well that there are a, a, a lot of proposals out there running around which, which, which can, you know, be put together into different, different, into different mixes. And, I think there has to be a great deal of experimentation and, and thinking. There was a question back there, and then there's one, one over here. Yeah, but I've got three, three comments. Um, one about uh, Hegel. Um, I agree everybody should read Whitehead on process and reality, uh, but I don't think it's right to counterpose Whitehead to Hegel because Whitehead is quite open about his debt to Hegel. If you turn Hegel on his head or on his feet, as, as, as Marx wanted to do, you dump the, the, meta, the idealistic metaphysics, you dump the teleology, I think what you're left with is process philosophy. So um, that's the debt, I think, that Marx has to Hegel. Second is, in terms of analogies with the natural sciences, uh, I like your one. Um, I often draw the analogy between Marx and evolutionary biology, um, which I think may be a better one, because Unlike thermodynamics and fluid dynamics and so on, there's even less that you can look to in evolutionary biology that has the status of a, of a, of a law. Um, it's all uh, processes, mechanisms, and so on. If you read Darwin, you've got a fantastic framework for, to start explaining the biological world, but you've got a lot of legwork to do to explain any particular biological phenomenon. Um, and there's a lot that Darwin missed and didn't understand and so on. So I think that's, that's a, a good analogy of what we can get from, from Marx. Third point is, in terms of uh, all the different factors that are, that are playing a role as social determinants, forces of production, relations of production, ideological factors, uh, and so on, um, how do we put those together to, 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 uh, so that we don't just have a mishmash of different uh, you know, bits and pieces? Um, I think class has a central role here, not because it's theoretically um, more important than the others, but because from the practical perspective, Marx doesn't just want to understand the world, he wants to change it. Yep. He sees class as the pivot of doing that. And so class relations and uh, uh, class agency has a special place in his, in his theoretical framework. And I think that if you, if you take it from that practical point of view, then the other things can fit into place around uh, a, a, a class perspective, which is which has got the, the the issue not only of how do we understand the war, but how do we how do we go about transforming it? Yeah, I guess my my um, well, yeah, I'm sympathetic to the last point, obviously, but I, I guess uh, um, the reason I, I would want to be a little bit cautious is I don't think that the only social relation which is significant is going to be class. Uh, and the whole kind of question of, uh, if you like, the social relations issue uh, is a, a broader transformative issue than, than simply the class kind of question. So I, I, I would want to, if you like, uh, uh, be a little cautious about being too, too specific about class being the central uh, central question. I mean, I tend, I tend myself always to come back to that perspective, uh, obviously, but I would not want to uh, turn that, that particular perspective into, if you like, a general, uh, a general principle of, of discussion and inquiry. Uh, on the uh, Hegel stuff, I mean, uh, I, as I remember, Whitehead said that he, could ever, he only ever got to about page three of Hegel before he went to sleep. I, uh, <laughs> and I had a certain sympathy with <laughs> I tell on that. I mean, I, I, that, that's what he said. He said that to Bertrand Russell at some point. I may have got the may have got it wrong, or maybe he was joking. I don't know. But uh, I didn't have the impression that he was a, a heavy reader of Hegel. He was. Why did Okay. Well, I'll stand corrected. He, he had much better of opinion of Hegel than Russell. Yeah. Well, yes. No, I know that. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Russell. Yeah. 
No, I, I uh, well, I'll, I'll go back and check that because uh, well, my my impression was otherwise. Maybe I was reading, maybe I was reading Russell or <coughs> putting words in, in in Whitehead's mouth. I don't know. It could could be. I remember reading something of uh, that sort. On the analogy, yeah, I mean, the the, the this coevolutionary theory argument comes out of a footnote where where Marx compares himself to Darwin and, and sees himself in, in in that, and I think that's another. Analogy. All I wanted to do with the uh, through a dynamics one is to look more close. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm I'm more interested in the fluid dynamics in some ways is because it, I I like to analogize uh, the economic uh, the global economic system as being rather like weather systems uh, circulating around planet Earth. You know, and you have high pressure zones here and you know depressions elsewhere, and you know and, and you have uh, Hurricanes going here, and uh, and uh, you know, so so you could add the analogy uh, is, is 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 for me it works better geographically to think about the analogy between the the, the, the weather system circulating around planet Earth and, uh, and uh, if you like the economic health systems moving around planet Earth as they do, so that a depression. Uh, which occurs in, uh, say, uh, the industrial districts of uh, North America and, and many Europe, you, it contrasts with, if you like, the uh, sunny skies in Bavaria and, and, and Silicon Valley and all. So I kind of, you know, I, so I like that analogy a little bit better than, than the evolutionary one. It gives me a bit more latitude to talk about the geographical dynamics. But some of it's a Yes, I'm interested in the distinction between the virtual economy, uh, that is, the derivatives the esoteric financial yeah. instruments and all of that versus the real economy that at least has some mooring in manufacturing other uh, production components and all of that. Just uh, does does Marx help us in understanding just how creative we'll, we can get in terms of focus on the real economy? Again, some of the yeah. brightest individuals out there are not uh, creating new manufacturing processes, but new financial instruments. How much we can invest in that uh, uh, virtual economy without, uh, let's say, uh, throwing off this this uh, uh, thermodynamic model that you've been projecting? Um, well, uh, you, you know, Marx, Marx is when you when you get to the, the stuff about credit and finance, uh, he introduces the uh, uh, the notion of fictitious capital, and. Uh, he, he make, doesn't make that much of it, except that after a while he, he does start to, to talk about uh, to talk about it as a fetish construct, um, and and then starts to clearly distinguish uh, between uh, what he called loan capital and and uh, capital that is circulating around uh, discounting bills of exchange, which actually says that, that the credit system is operating at uh, both ends of the accumulation process. I mean, the o most obvious example would be, you know, financiers lend to, to developers who build house, tract housing in San Diego, and then they have to sell them to somebody, and then the same financiers will lend to people, no matter whether they have decent credit or not, in order to buy the the housing so that so they you know the financiers in a sense sit up here and they manage both the supply of housing and the demand for it and and you can see immediately that and he marks points out that this is this is loan capital into production and and this is actually uh, capital which is being used to realize values in the market and and uh, and then he's there is out of this comes this possibility of, uh, of fictitious constructions uh, and, and speculative, so he, he, he begins to see that, but he does, really doesn't make much of it. And this is the kind of thing where, he, where, I mean, Engels is writing about part five of volume three of Capital, and he says the whole thing is an absolutely god-awful mess. Uh, I tried for about three years to clean it up and then gave up and decided just to print it as it, as it stood. Um, and it is a mess, but, but you can get some things out of it of this kind. So the fictitious stuff is really very interesting. Uh, and again, this is one of the things where you have to complete his argument. And, I, and the limits to capital, it struck me that this is a very important category. And I often sort of talked to, talked about it. And I had this wonderful time, uh, one time in uh, teaching Marx class. It was a year. It was very big. 
It was so big we had to have it in the cafeteria of the, uh, of the Graduate Center. And if you know the cafeteria of the Graduate Center, it's here like this. There's a big atrium up there. The Empire State Building's up there. And I have an audience of about 120. And I'm thinking, God, I'm teaching Marxist capital. And I'm like, I'm finally arrived, you know. Anyway, it, it was open, you see. And all kinds of people were coming in. And there was this guy who always came in. And he was always wearing a suit and tie, this kind of stuff. I wondered who he was. And right at the end, I was talking about fictitious capital. And, and, and this must have been 2003. Because the day after, he says, oh, I'm the guy who always comes with a you know, suit and tie. So you probably know who I am. And he says, I'm a broker with Bear Stearns. And he said, uh, interesting you're talking about fictitious capital. And he sent me all those, those circulars that Warren Buffett was sending around saying, you know, all these, all these derivatives things are we weapons of mass financial destruction. <laughs> so I wonder what happened to this guy when he stayed with Bear Stearns and whether he got out in time, having read capital, you know, so. So, so, I, so, so yeah, the, now the fictitious stuff is very, very important. But again, that is part of the theory that, that Marx did not complete adequately at all. And, and it's one that, that needs, uh, needs a good deal of, uh, of attention. But again, there's a bit of a template when you, I mean, I've been wrestling with those chapters because I'm actually going to bring them into volume two because, you know, I'm going to put part of volume three in volume two just to see how it works. And I've been wrestling with those chapters, uh, and, but there, is, there, is, there are some clues in there as to things that, that might be worth looking for. There, so somebody back there somewhere, yeah. Uh, you said that, that Marx was trying to end it, uh, uh, writing about how the surplus value is produced within capitalist mode of production. And yeah. yeah, you call this text as a template that we should make. We should, that might help us. To that My question is, how can we make use of this template uh, in a world where non-capitalist forms of production exist along with the capitalist form of yeah. production, like forced labor, household, No, that's not true. <laughs> no, no, there, were, there were plenty of workers around. Uh, there was a lot of unemployment immediately after the commune. And uh, uh, as happened in the Haussmann period, one of the things that they... But uh, actually, raising the money was very difficult. And, and uh, they even raised a lot of money. There's a, there's a, there's a chapel in the basement there, which is a workers' chapel. They, they, the Catholic, see one of the things that happened after the commune was uh, some Catholics got um, rather ashamed of what had happened in the name of Catholicism. And uh, so you get a reformist Catholicism that tried to uh, set up workers' circles and collect money so you could you could actually buy a brick uh, so you can actually go down to the basement and, and you'll see somebody's name on a, on a brick uh, for the and, and so there's a workers chapel there so workers were involved in it and, and construction workers were and, and, and the thing wasn't completed until 1918 you know I mean so it took many many years and it, there were times when it was stopped and it didn't you know, it was more financial problems than anything else, and the political problems as well. The thing I liked about it was this proposal they were going to ex sort of erect a super-sized, double-sized Statue of Liberty and put it right in front of Sacré-Cœur, so that instead of seeing Sacré-Cœur from the center of Paris, you'd see this big Statue of Liberty up there instead. So this is a big proposal in 1905, you yeah. know mask the, the, the place. Uh, how do you relate to, to, to non capital Well, it depends what you're talking about. I mean, I, if you're talking about unpaid work, the, the, the whole question uh, that Marx poses is, of course, the production of a relative surplus population and uh, the creation of an industrial reserve army. And the conditions of the industrial reserve army are uh, a matter of very considerable uh, interest. Uh, to the dynamics of how capitalism works and how an industrial reserve army is kept alive, and what the and right now, of course, with with uh, you know 
unemployment insurance, uh, the state is supposed to help, uh, you know, but now the big attack by austerity is to take all of that away and, and, and let the Industrial Reserve Army fend for itself. So there's that side of it, but then there's the Industrial Reserve, um, and as Samir Amin says about Africa, this is the big labor reserve for global capitalism. And so I think that, uh, I don't think there are distinctive modes of production out there anymore. I mean, there are degrees of self-sufficiency and you've always got a certain hybridity you're never talking about a pure capitalist system anyway, and Mark, when Marx is talking about this template as a pure capitalist system, but within that pure capitalist system you can see immediately that the question of the Industrial Reserve Army is a critical question, and where it is and how it's mobilized and, and how it lives and all that kind of thing. Uh, well, capital either says, well, let them bother about that, they'll, they'll find their own way, they'll live somehow or whether they actually feel they have to set up uh, mechanisms to ensure uh, their, uh, uh, their reproduction um, is, you know, that's a big uh, kind of question. And actually, uh, at this point the state gets in, I mean, one of the things that uh, became clear both uh, to uh, the British and but it, particularly the French in the uh, uh, in the, the war against uh, the 1870 war against Germany, uh, was that the French working class was so debilitated that it couldn't, it wasn't a fighting force. I mean, people who are semi crippled and, and who are mal malnourished don't make uh, good. So, so there's also a kind of question about you know, military manpower and the condition of, 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 of the population. <coughs> You know, again, that comes back to the condition of the reserve. So, for military reasons, uh, there was an attempt uh, to sort of uh, improve the qualities of life for the French working class in particular after 1870, because there was a recognition that it had not made a, uh, it was no match whatsoever for the Germans. It wasn't fit enough, it wasn't strong enough, uh, and, and many people had industrial uh, diseases and, and, and the like. So, um, you know, if you if, if you're talking about that, but then there's, there's another issue. Well, you, you know, are there, are there parts of the world that are organized on purely non-capitalist lines? I don't know, are there? Um, there, there are people who are the excluded, uh, that's true, uh, but excluded populations are not outside of the dynamics of, of capital accumulation. So I, I think that right now, I think we're in a different situation than was the situation in Marx's times when you had peasant populations that were, you know, genuinely peasant populations and living on, on, on in self-sufficient uh, kinds of conditions. But I think uh, that's pretty much disappeared globally. I mean, there's still indigenous populations, and, but, but they're relatively, you know, small in relative to the total global population. So I, I think there's a, uh, I don't think, to me that's not, really an issue, except, except in so far as the pure theory that Marx sets out as a template uh, always has to be adjusted around, you know, the, what are the social relations prevailing, what are the kind of ethnic differences and, you know, how are, how are things being orchestrated uh, politically. So, I, I mean, again, that's the kind of work we have to do for ourselves and doesn't, it's not given to you by the template. Somebody else over there? Oh, yeah. Um, in your discussion of um, production, distribution, exchange, and consumption, you kind of emphasize that the production of surplus value is key, yeah. and, but you also seem to suggest to me that these other moments were also created surplus value. And in my reading of Capital One, it seems like Marx goes out of his way to make sure that, to identify only the exploitation of, of labor power as the sole source of the production of, labor, of surplus value other than permanent accumulation or dispossession. So I just wanted to make sure, I just want to see if you were taking issue with that or, or separating yourself from that or, you know, could you clarify a little bit? Well, I think, well, yeah, when Marx kind of says, look, it's the production of surplus value that, that, that really matters here, and then clearly that comes back to the class relation uh, and uh, the exploitation of living labor in production, that's, that's it. But, uh, as you know, the rate of surplus value is affected, for example, by the dynamics of technological change. I mean, what is the theory of relative surplus value about? It's about you know, the use of technological change to procure greater levels of surplus value 
through the exploitation of living labor and production. But when you start to look even deeper into these, these changes, it, this involves certain social changes too, in terms of the relationship, for example, between mental and manual labor. So, and, and uh, there was interesting moments when you start to talk about uh, the necessity for education of the workforce. Uh, because fluidity of labor is a very important thing, so that again, the Factory Acts and the institutional arrangements of the Factory Acts start to become very important in the dynamics, as does the whole kind of regulation of the working day, so the institutional arrangements actually enter into affecting the dynamics of, uh, of, of surplus value creation. So all of those moments I've talked about are actually there, surrounding the central issue, which is probably what was being said earlier about the class relation, which is which is absolutely central, which is this, uh, which, which is of course the, the extraction of surplus value uh, through the exploitation of living labor and production. So that is, if you like, the way in which it, uh, uh, I think it, I think it works. And all of those elements I've said are actually involved in the production of surplus value. Uh, 